the animal behind me has killed more Americans than any other animal in North America. Old Vessie, old Bossy, the milk cow. Look at that guy out there. Is there any animal that you would think less likely to be a killer? I mean, the face of a cow is the gentlest and most wonderful face of any animal. Big or small, they have those cow eyes. But right through the end of the 19th century, hundreds of thousands of Americans were either killed or made sick to the point that something else killed them because of these critters. 18th and 19th century communities like this one, and I don't have to name it, because it's representative of communities all over the Northeast and Midwest. You can see the results of this invisible scourge in the little graveyards that are scattered all around your community. These little graveyards are filled with victims of a terrible disease that they had names for, but they had no idea what was causing. While this disease was often fatal, it was also a contributing factor in many of the deaths incurred by the communities from other diseases. This beautiful late 18th century house behind me has a history all to itself in the community. And at one point, the farmer was engaged in pasturing livestock. Well, all along the roadside, right in front of this beautiful home, is growing the culprit in the disease that I'm talking about. Notice the bunching. This is a real heavy stand of a plant called white snake root. And this plant was responsible for a disease that was known by a variety of names like the trembles or the tremors, the slows, or as it's called today, milk sickness. The plant that I'm showing you here is white snake root. And this plant probably killed more than 100,000 Americans in the 18th and 19th century. Yeah, the heck with it. I'll throw in the 17th century too. This plant killed Lincoln's mother. It is a plant that grows naturally here in North America that the Europeans had no experience with. And when they brought their livestock across the ocean with them and let them graze openly, and remember the early Puritan settlements here in New England were astonished by the massive growth of field interspersed with copses of trees, allowing places like Brookfield and Springfield, Mass to just let their animals graze. And Brookfield, particularly, uh, a selectman wrote about being able to let the cattle and the, uh, the goats out into the pastures and still see them two miles away. So if you've been through the Brookfields, North Brookfield, West Brookfield, uh, East Brookfield, if you've been out there today and seen how much forest there is, imagine what it must have been like in 1670, 1680, 1690. The cattle just wandered and meandered through the fields, and growing in those fields was white snake root. If you look at it, you can see, here's, here's one that's flowering right now. And they flower, but you'll notice these are all white, and very delicate little flowers. The leaves are spade-shaped with a serrated edge, and the stalk of the plant ha you know, can go from a medium green right into a purple, as you can see here. And the cattle grazed on this plant. And ultimately, people drank their milk, people ate their meat, and they got sick. Look at that stalk, which is particularly purple right there. People noticed that the cattle would sometimes develop what they called the tremors. And they, they shake, and they lose weight, and they die. 
was uh, tragic if you were a small farmer in colonial New England. But it happened to the people too. The people got the shakes. They couldn't keep anything down. They became lethargic. They developed stomach cramping, awful pains in their digestive system. Ultimately, they passed. This toxic plant that was passing on its toxicity through milk and meat was wreaking havoc, not only on the colonial settlers, but right through the late 19th century. It's really impossible to say how many people died of this disease. Well, this poisoning. Because it certainly weakened lots of people all over the Northeast, all the way out into the Midwest, and down, I guess, as far as uh, northern Alabama, throughout the what we call eastern woodlands. And certainly people were afflicted by this and didn't die, but died of something else as their body was weakened by ingesting this plant consistently. So cemeteries like the one behind me continued to fill with the dead of the milk sickness all across the northern reaches of what was the United States as they had for centuries before, except for in one county in Illinois, Hardin County, where a woman, a real badass, such a badass that when she was being abused by a second husband, accused of hiding a treasure in a cave somewhere in the community, and he was threatening to beat her or even kill her, she jumped off a cliff into the tree boughs below her, which broke her fall and made her escape. I mean, we're talking about a badass, and she ought to have a movie made about her, I would think. But Anna Pierce Bixby, her name was, used empirical evidence to bust the milk sickness, at least in her county. She determined that it was a seasonal disease. She noticed that the people that were passing of the milk sickness were apparently dying during the summer season. It wasn't very prevalent in late winter or early spring, but in summer, fall, and early winter, people were dying of this disease. It was seasonal. And she immediately thought it must be being caused by some kind of herb that our cattle are eating. Didn't seem like it was being spread through the consumption of goat's milk or sheep's milk, but it seemed like cow's milk was somehow responsible. Why no one else made this connection, we have no idea. But she was studying this in the 1820s. She was at a loss for what particular herb it would be. While she had a good grasp of the various plants and herbs that grew in her part of southern Illinois, she wasn't sure. There were several that she thought might be the culprit, but she had not been able to make any sense of it until she met what we can only call a medicine woman, a Shawnee woman, formerly from Chillicothe, who had probably known Tecumseh, the great war chief, and working with this medicine woman, basically explaining to her what the problem was, the medicine woman brought her to an odd plant and said, I think it might be this. Everybody always thinks about native tribes being completely exterminated. Well, it's not quite what went on. Usually the tribes would be dispersed and there would be small groups of native people that would remain on their land living in an assimilated style, usually as a second or third rate citizens. Such was the life of this medicine woman when she described the snake root as the potential vector for the milk sickness, the Anna Pierce Bixby. So after speaking to the Shawnee medicine woman, sometime in the late 1820s, Anna gets a cow of her own, a calf, and begins experimenting on that calf, feeding it only white snake root. When the calf 
develops the trembles, she knows she's got the vector. Now, Anna had been trained in Philadelphia as a midwife and dentist, and she was acting as the physician in Hardin County, Illinois. And she basically spread the word that this plant needed to be eradicated from any livestock pasturage. And people got to work. They, they didn't have Roundup in those days. They went out and tore it up by hand, making sure they got a chunk of the root. Let's grab a hunk of it there and comes up in a clump as you can see. I don't like destroying a plant, but for the purpose of the video, they pulled it right up. And guess what? Milk sickness went away in Hardin County. But the problem was Anna was a woman. She wasn't anyone connected to anybody in particular. She didn't have a great pedigree. She wasn't Harvard educated or anything like that. And the result was for the next hundred years, it was 1834 that she figured out the vector, but it persisted everywhere else, claiming how many more lives until finally in 1928, I'm not a mathematician, but that's so, uh, almost a hundred years. They finally figured out a man, a distinguished male doctor, figured out the connection between white snake root and the milk sickness. How many people died as the result of the fact that Anna Bixby was not heated? kind of amazing. But I think we have a little bit more to the story to tell. So I'm in the hills of western Massachusetts on a beautiful dirt road and I'm walking along a patch, as you now know, of white snake root just growing by the side of the road. And it's on the other side of the road too. That's a beautiful specimen right there. Look at the dark red stem coming up and florets. Beautiful with a little Joe Pieweed to keep it company and some goldenrod and one of our favorites, remember, to protect us from poison ivy, jewelweed. Look at that specimen down there with the florets blazing. Yeah, this is white snake root and it's growing along the side of this dirt road because it was never eradicated from this area. I'm not a fan of eradicating it. I'm just telling you, it was never eradicated. Out in the Midwest, White snake root was deliberately eradicated in Hardin County first, and then in the 1930s and 40s by the Department of Agriculture and by farmers who didn't want to die of the milk sickness. Now out here in southern New England, where the land below 2,000 feet had been cleared to pasture our friends, the Merino sheep, and you can see that this was once a Merino sheep pasturage. Look at that stone wall right there. Stone walls crisscrossing the New England countryside show us our connection to those crazy sheep and the, uh, the ambassador to Spain from Vermont who brought them here. This plant was never cleared from our forests. It didn't need to be cleared because our farmers were farming sheep and they certainly weren't eating the meat. They were basically shearing the sheep for that great merino wool. So this didn't bother them. Now, as this land that was formerly used for merino sheep pasturage was purchased by people that are trying to get back to the land. Remember that song by Joni Mitchell made popular by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young? Woodstock, it's got that line in it. Gotta get myself back to the land and set my soul free. Well, it seems like a lot of fans of the good old 60s folk have decided to buy themselves farms in their retirement. And farmers markets are filled with hobby farms, milks, and cheeses. People are becoming cheesemongers. And people are even selling beef. Now because we don't eat this stuff all the time, we're not drinking the same milk from the same cow day in and day out and eating the meat from that herd 
Getting the milk sickness is going to be fairly difficult, but you could be getting sick and not know it. And you'll go to the doctor. Now, can you imagine going into, uh, you know, HMO or the emergency room with the symptoms of the milk sickness? Your stomach's cramping up. You got gas pains. You're feeling dizzy and weak. And you might even be developing the shakes. And you go in there and you sit down and PA comes out and checks you out. Do you think you're going to get diagnosed with the milk sickness in this day and age? There's going to be a hundred other things you're going to think of before that. Lyme disease and they're going to come up with all kinds of different... Be careful. Something I've always said. It takes a lot to be a farmer. You don't just become a farmer. The farmers that work the land and you look at them as quaint and cute are people that have studied agriculture their entire lives. They learn from their fathers and their grandfathers as they say, as Isaac Newton said, they're standing on the shoulders of giants. These people have generations of knowledge behind them and they missed the connection here. You better believe that farmers in the Midwest still know what this is. But I'll tell you, they probably have their problem with hobby farmers too. Here in Sheffield, Mass, people have been dairy farming along the Housatonic River for hundreds of years. These are not hobby farms. These are real dairy farms. And you will notice as you drive the roads here that you don't see white snake root. Meanwhile, in the old Merino sheep farms, white snake root is very apparent. These are some cows that know how to live. You are looking at the gentle faces of the greatest animal killer of Americans in American history and colonial history, the cow. How now, brown cow? How can it be that the cow can be such a great killer? Look at the gentle faces. Although from the kayak I'm in right now, I kind of am getting the feeling I probably ought to do a little bit of maneuvering because I'm getting stared at by old bossy right there. The greatest animal killer of humans is I and me right now. And I'm in a kayak. I don't know if a kayak can outrun a cow. <laughs>